easy to remember, parkinson.ca for the Parkinson's Society of Canada site. Uh, this is parkinson.org, which is the National Parkinson's Foundation. Uh, you have a search engine up at the top there, and if you type in any topic you want, you'll find something about it, or you can click on Parkinson's disease and you'll get this video that drops down with different subjects. And they have a series of very good overviews of exercise, of diet, surgery, uh, very good library to, to search there and you can download the information. Um, we move covers everything matter I do for a living, all these conditions, but under Parkinson's disease again you can find quite a bit of information. So those are the better websites out there. Don't like the computer, you don't use the internet, you can go to the library and there's all, all sorts of uh, reference books that you can get to the Parkinson's as well. So, education is huge, people have to understand the disease. And that first appointment, when people want to know, is there anything I can do other than medications to try to prevent me from getting worse over the years? Exercise is huge. This is uh, an example of two rodents, both the same age. This one has been exercised regularly at McMaster University, and this one's just sat around not exercising at McMaster University. And you can see the difference in them. That one's looking a little bit like me getting gray, losing the hair, and it's falling off. Uh, the only difference between these two animals is the amount of exercise they've had in their life. Uh, so, as I talk to my patients and tell them how important exercise is to try to slow down what otherwise will be a progressive illness, I think to myself, I really should listen to this. See, we might get back to Parkinson's music. Uh, so, this is exercise is probably good for all of us, not just people with Parkinson's disease. It's particularly important for Parkinson's disease. And how much exercise should you get? Well, we don't really know. More is better than none. Uh, the overall advice usually is about three hours a week, divided in any way you want. What type of exercise, we don't know. But it's probably more than just uh, a quiet stroll. You've probably got to exercise to the point of getting a little bit short of breath, so it's hard to, get, to have a conversation with somebody because you're huffing and puffing a little bit. It doesn't mean that a walk isn't good for you. It's far better than sitting still on a couch. But the type of exercise that they think might slow down the progression of some of these conditions is got to be cardiovascular fitness producing. Driving is the most stressful thing I could ever talk about at the first appointment. I'm not sure why I tend to do that. It's not that important at the first appointment, but I forget about it if I don't talk about it at the first appointment. Uh, in Manitoba, it's a reportable condition, so I did the red letter to the motor aid branch on day one saying this person has Parkinson's. They're very early on, and there's no reason to think that they've not continued to safety by the car, but this should be reassessed annually. As soon as I've done that, they have a system in place where once a year the patient will get a letter from the motor vehicle branch to remind them just to check with their family doctor to make sure they're still fit to drive. At that point, if it falls not well and that patient isn't in the state where I absolutely need to treat them on that first appointment, I don't start any medications, but I get them to come back fairly soon because it comes up in any first visit with a doctor, if they mention Parkinson's disease at the beginning, the patient doesn't do anything else at that point. Uh, so you've got to bring them back when they're less anxious and are more ready to hear that information. At the following point, uh, we're going to discuss medications, and there's two broad topics. Are there any pills that are out there that can prevent me from getting worse as time goes on? The answer to that is no. Uh, and I can try to explain this graph, but there's a medication called rosagiline, which we'll talk about a little later, that can provide symptom relief in Parkinson's. And the company uh, did a very large study looking at whether one milligram a day would slow down the progression of the disease in people who took the medication compared to people who didn't take the medication. And it turned out that at the end of that study, there wasn't 
enough difference between the two groups that it looked like indeed this might slow down the progression of the disease. But unfortunately, the company also looked at a two milligram dose, which at the end, the two lines came together. And the conclusion was, we're not sure. And none of us are sure, and we're still waiting for more information to decide on something like this. Uh, and we'll see that. So the, the main medical treatments out there are really to manage symptoms, not to change what's going to happen over the years. And as a result, there's no hurry to start that. The typical tendency is to start them once a person's quality of life is affected. Now, quality of life is a very individual thing. If you're working for a living, you need motor skills to do your job, that's one thing. If you're retired, but your symptoms are interfering with you going out and socializing and do the things you like to do in life, that's another reason to, to initiate medications. And like almost everything that affects the brain, Parkinson's is described as a problem with chemical imbalance in the brain. You can't make enough dopamine. And relative to that, you don't have enough to see maybe you've got too much you see the and weight and the, the scale down on that side. So there's two approaches chemically to try to fix this balance. We can block acetylcholine, try to lift that back so the scale's even again. And uh, from that point of view, we're sort of relatively helping out the dopamine side of things. Few medications that act to block acetylcholine. There's anticholinergics. There's also this one, which is also a bit of an anticholinergic, but it's often described as a separate <coughs> we look at these ones, these anticholinergics, uh, don't use them that much because of side effects. Particularly in older people, they're very hard on memory. But in some young onset patients, it's very persistent tremor, or a lot of that dystonia, twisting foot problem, will sometimes consider it. And they're very good to dry up the mouth. Uh, so if somebody has a lot of excess of saliva, you might consider it. Constipation is a big side effect of it, and it's a problem for most people before you actually start those medications. We've heard of this one as the uh, red jelly bean, although it's not curved and it doesn't taste as good. Um, but amantamine is an anticholinergic that has some other properties. It's the only medication out there that can help both the slowness and stiffness as well as the Michael J. Fox dyskinetic movements. Uh, so that's probably its main role in our practice. When people that get to the point where they have that excessive movement problem as a side effect of their medication at the time of the day, it can help quite a bit. That's an advantage of lasting a long time, so you only need to take it twice a day. But it can also aggravate constipation and memory problems. You have to be careful with it in older patients. So get past dealing with the acetylcholine side of things and we're now with dopamine, trying to add more dopamine to the scale somehow. So leave it open without the question is the best drug with the least number of side effects. So this is the medication. Once you start the medication, this is the one that you're going to be on for the rest of your life for Parkinson's disease. It's a weird pill because most pills you buy at the pharmacy has, have a certain number of milligrams, and this one has two sets of milligrams. The most common one is 100 over 25. So it's got 100 milligrams of the active chemical, olivodopa, the body converts it into dopamine. But if we just gave you that, you'd throw up. So they, they mix in an anti-nausea that also prevents the levodopa feet from being broken down in the rest of the body so that it can get up into the brain at where it's supposed to. And so if you look at the, the pills up there, you can see there's all sorts of combinations depending on exactly what you need, how much, uh, how long you want it to last. There's a variety of different combinations of pills. There's also this other dopamine product called Prolopa. The only difference between it and the one that we showed you is the anti nausea is a chemical called benzerazide instead of carbidopa. It comes in capsules, can't break it in half, but 
it's certainly a, a drug that is used out there as well. It has the same effect as the other preparation. So we've got levodopa, the body converts into dopamine. We've got carbidopa mixed into the pills as an anti nausea to counteract the side effects and increase the amount of risk to the brain. The two main types of it are regular release, which used to be just called levodopa, but once a continuous release hormone came around, we now changed the name to the regular release for the old yellow tablets. The controlled release ones are supposed to last about 50% longer, so if the pills don't last, doses is something that we consider. Although they're fairly erratic, the chronic release of cinnamon CR of the, that product used to be fairly erratically absorbed, so we find it a little hard to depend on it. So we often will stick to the, the regular release products. As Manager mentioned, you've got to, if you're going to start this drug, it's a bit of a contract with your doctor, you're going to be on it for a while. We don't have to fix you by next Tuesday. So we start with just a half a tablet at breakfast. It's the best pill, at least from the side effects. We don't want you coming back saying, I can't tolerate this pill, I want something else. So we go really slow with our prescription, and it may take a, a couple of months to get you up to a therapeutic dose, depending on how well you do. The side effects are stomach upset, as well as lowering your blood pressure. It dilates the blood vessels in your legs. Stand up, so the blood go up your brain and put it down into your legs and you feel weak and dizzy. It can cause you to be sleepy and it can older people start to cause cloudiness of thinking and even frank confusion or hallucinations. Um, this has started to happen in Winnipeg, I don't know if it's got the Thunder Bay or London, but uh, the company that has been making this drug has uh, decided to change the way it looks. It's a bit of a nightmare for me, and certainly it's going to be looking up. Maybe it may not come through on the slide very well, but that is a dark blue, this is a light blue. They're changing to pills that only look different if you read the number. And the cinnamon CR, which is 100 versus 200, used to be a completely different size, a different color. These are exactly the same shape and size. So I'm not sure. What person was responsible for coming up with this idea, but somebody who works for Merck, and I think it's absolutely disgusting, but I can't do anything about it, it's going to just mean that people are going to have to be very careful in making sure they don't mix the pills in the bottle like they used to be able to because they're not different colors. But you can already scoring that. Yeah, yeah, so you can't, you used to be able to break this one in half, and not stores, so you can't do that. It really is frankly odd that they've done this. I don't understand. But they say my patients are now phoning me and saying, I just got out my new prescription, it's a different color. So this is happening kind of as we speak at the pharmacies. Uh, Don Caravel is not a fine wine. Um, it's a little white pill, but it's very, very helpful. It helps counteract the nausea and the low blood pressure. So in people, typically older people, I find typically older women seem to be particularly prone to low blood pressure, even on a, a little bit of levodopa when you first start them on it. So this down parallel pill counteracts those side effects and allows you to, to get the patient onto an effective dose of medication. The other large category of medications are agonists, which are chemical mimics of levodopa. Levodopa is still the best one, but other companies want to be able to help patients with Parkinson's disease as well as produce medications that they can sell. And so they got their chemists to make chemicals that look like levodopa. And uh, they are, they look like a duck, but it's not the same duck. So they have a collection of characteristics. And not any detail on this at all, but there's a variety of different receptors in the brain that dopamine acts on. And so synthetic dopamine medication may have a different profile, a different way of acting on the brain than levodopa does. So this isn't reproducing the dopamine exactly. The two main ones that are available are Pramiketzol and Rolkinol. You also 
titrate these up slowly with crown pencil. You can typically get to an effective dose with the patient in about four weeks. Clopinerol is a little more complicated, different colored pills, uh, and you have to work your way typically to about nine weeks to get to an effective dose. So we've decided, and we'll tell you why we decided which shortly, but we decided at that first point to discuss medication to get them on medication. And I expect that pill to work well. I see patients on average of every six months, and every second time I see them on average, I'm having to adjust their medication to keep up with their disease. But early on, in the first three years, they're going to be in what's called a honeymoon period, which means that their medication is not necessarily exactly level, but it's good enough to keep their symptoms under control evenly throughout the day. So they're in what's called this therapeutic window. They've got enough medication to control their symptoms, and they're not over the top, so they're not having any of the excessive side effects of the medication. So if ever somebody comes in and they sit down and they say, how are you doing? They say, fine. It's very tempting when you're a busy neurologist to say, goodbye. Uh, that, that's an ideal opportunity to talk to them about things that you normally may not have time to. Because most patients, when they come in, don't say they're fine. They just have lots of things to complain about. But if they're stable, even at this early stage, we've got to remind uh, them and their families that the mortality likelihood of a human is 100%. Right? None of us have proven that wrong. Well, we, we, we have yet to prove it right. But no one in the past has proven it. So you got to plan for that. And you want to plan for that when you're healthy and able to make decisions for yourself. So uh, had they call it palliative care, and they need a name change. Because when you mention palliative care, everybody says, well, I'm going to die of cancer. Um, but no, palliative care is life plan. End of life plan. So early on, you want to make sure the patient understands well, what does this disease mean to you as the years are going to go by and to your family. And already you want to start making sure, you know, have you thought about a will? Have you thought about signing somebody in the authority to make decisions for you for health, for, for, um, health decisions, a health proxy? when it comes to the point where you can't do that on your own name. And let them know they likely at that stage no medical emergency is going to occur because of Parkinson's disease, but if something goes wrong, they should know at least which hospital they should go to, the one that has a neurologist compared to the one that may not, etc. Right. So eventually what's going to happen is they're going to come in for a follow-up appointment, and they're going to start to no longer be in this honeymoon period. They're going to start to have fluctuations, so they're Bills no longer provide an even response throughout the day. So let's go back to levodopa. The blood level is up and down. As long as we're doing okay early on, we're in this therapeutic window the patient is on, it was working well all day long. And as I mentioned, unfortunately, uh, the disease progresses over time, uh, and at the same time, you're getting older. So you're less uh, likely to tolerate the side effects same time as you need more medication to make you feel good. And what results in an average of five to ten years after the diagnosis and medication is starting is you're now getting into this stage of fluctuations. You get side effects from part of the day, you get your symptoms breaking through in other parts of the day. The most and the earliest phenomenon is the pill you take at lunch doesn't last until supper start to run out before your supper meal, you get below this therapeutic window so your tremor or your stiffness is almost comes up. And over time, I come out before lunch and first thing in the morning as well. That's called wearing off. And the wearing off symptoms are basically the symptoms you started with before you started medication. So they come back again. But as we'll hear this afternoon, there's a lot of non-motor symptoms that may also become very prominent at that time as well. So this is a series of videos that are very striking. 
uh, for healthcare professionals that are not familiar with Parkinson's disease. This gentleman is off. He's the first thing in the morning. His pills haven't started to work yet. His mouth is open. He's not blinking. He can barely lift his arms. He's one to help the other. Very slow. Here's the same patient that after the pills have started to work, he's now on. He's very functional. He's comfortable. And if he goes over the top of the therapeutic window, he gets blood level going too high. He gets what's called peak dose dyskinesia. And all I have to say is Michael J. Fox now to explain that to patients. But the same man, probably 20 minutes after the previous video, when the blood level's gone up over the top, and now he has excessive movements. And so, now that we've seen fluctuations, you'll understand, well, that's a bit of a problem. Maybe it'd be nice to try to figure out a pill that might avoid that. And that's where it comes into this choice. How do you decide on what to start patients with at the beginning? And the big choice is if you start the levodopa, the best drug with the least number of side effects overall, or you start with the dopaminase. And we don't have audio in the room, but uh, this is this uh, newscaster from the States who uh, <coughs> described Michael J. Fox as faking this movement, actually bringing it on for attention. He was mimicking it there. Um, he was uh, he did not doing well with popularity polls after that. Uh, but we know from a variety of studies that people, if you start them, this is the likelihood of getting to the percent of people who go on to get fluctuations and dyskinesias. If you start them on levodopa compared to starting them on primopexol. So there is quite a big difference, especially in young patients. About a third of them are as likely to get dyskinesia as when they start on levodopa. But the problem is that the agonists, and I've said several times, leave it over the desk, but at least number of side effects, so that means that the building agonists must have more, and they do. The first thing that came out after these drugs were on the market is people started to fall asleep when they're driving with the, the dopamine agonists, which was a, a big issue. It's not a common issue, it's associated with sleepiness the rest of the day, not just when you're driving. It's very, very important if you're on dopamine agonists or if you're writing a prescription for some of these for them to know about this. So if they get sleepy, they shouldn't drive and they should call. No sooner had been we kind of figured out how to deal with that, that the next problem that hit was there was a uh, observation that patients on these medications were going out. Sometimes for the first time I heard they're gambling. They can't control their gambling. It's addictive behavior. It's not just gambling, there's other things. There's uh, hypersexuality, there's excessive uh, shopping, buying things you don't really need. And the overall likelihood of that sleepiness is probably around 12%. The overall likelihood of impulse control problem is 13%. So that means one out of every four patients that we put on agonists is going to have a pretty bad side effect. And we've got to explain this to patients when we talk about, yes, this drug, if you go on it, you're less likely to get this than easy in five years, but we may cause significant other problems in the meantime. And it's a very individual decision what, what ends up actually happening. So the choice really depends on that individual patient and how uh, you can read patients pretty quickly, the ones that are likely going to be forthcoming and let you know right away if they're making, if the drugs are making you sleepy as opposed to the ones that they know if you tell your doctor you're sleepy and he's going to pull your driver's license. So you, you've come to know patients pretty well and some of that knowledge helps you make decisions about which medications you're going to try. Okay. A lot of education. Now, as people get older, it turns out the likelihood of them ever having dyskinesia goes down and out of market. So if you're less than 51 and we start to leave a dopa, in three years, you have about a 44% likelihood of having that as a problem. If you're 51 to 65, it drops to 25%. You're over 65, it's only 12% likelihood of getting the only reason you start on an agonist. So 
ophthalmologist who were paying attention to this information is they had a patient who was 65 or older. They're not going to use the open agonists for them. They're just going to go straight to the best drug with the least number of side effects. Because at age 65, those patients are much more likely to experience some of the low blood pressure and confusion. So you may as well use the best drug with the least number of side effects. So I got to just kind of summarize. Leave it open is cheaper. It works better. Early on, it probably worked pretty close to the same, but after a few years, the levodopa works better. It's less likely to cause uh, stomach uh, GI side effects like nausea. It's less likely to cause confusion and hallucinations. It's less likely to cause somnia. It's less likely to cause hallucinations and less likely to cause some of that addictive behavior problem. On the other side, the agonists, they last longer, so you don't fluctuate up and down as much when you're on them. You're less likely to get dyskinesia because you don't fluctuate up and down, you're not going to get as much wearing off. The pamapexol has been shown to have significant antidepressant effects. And it also is good for apathy, because, yeah, as soon as you're not doing anything today, thank you. Uh, so you can improve motivation with that. And, uh, Again, front pencil can be a bit of an appetite stimulant. People eat more if they're thin, you can get them to gain weight. So that, those are the things that we balance up when we try to make a decision which one to use. So we can see them again and they're having these fluctuations, whatever we pick to begin with. It's really hard in a clinic appointment to figure out, can you tell me what really is going on in your day? So having a patient fill out a diary or if you don't have them checked off, if they write down the time of day, it's the worst, the time of day is the best, and when you're taking your pills, so your doctor can figure out how to adjust things to fix. Sometimes people don't have a whole day to be fixing, they just have an hour prior to supper. And if they come in and say, you know, doctor, I have pain, I have nausea, I have tremor, I can't move, there's a tendency to increase the entire dose the whole day, but if they say, but that only happens for an hour at 4.30 of the day, and all I have to do is add a half a bill prior to the 4.30 time of all those symptoms. It's very important, in addition to letting your doctor know what's wrong with you, what time of day is happening relative to when you take your medication. And so if somebody's on regular levodopa or an agonist, well, what are the things that we can do to help fix this wearing off problem. We can switch to the longer acting medication. This is a mention in the last 50% longer. But there's some other tricks. So there's lots of people trying to figure out how to help patients with Parkinson's disease. And they realize that the dopamine is broken down by enzymes in the body that everyone has. And so if you can block those enzymes, you can keep the dopamine around a little longer and fill in the gaps between their pills. So if we block this enzyme called COMT, which the full term is catecholamine methyltransferase, then that might make dopamine last longer. And so let's invent a drug that does that. We have it's called COMPAN or endocomb. And the idea is you take a 200 milligram tablet of this every time you take your levodopa, and it's supposed to make it last about half an hour longer. And uh, it's a big brown pill that can turn the urine dark, which frightens people unless you explain the urine's going to get dark because of the pigment you built. Yep, okay. uh, some people can get diarrhea on it, which can be very persistent and have, has to have the uh, medication withdrawn, but otherwise it's pretty well tolerated. Uh, companies decided, well, this is such a good drug that we have, we're going to just go ahead and put it, put a pill together with the Medoba. called Stolivo, and it's now available. Is it, is it covered in Ontario? Yes, it's not covered in Manitoba, so I haven't had to introduce it. <laughs> They're all different shades of brown and different shapes, and you can use this instead of combining a compound pill together with the Medoba. The other enzyme you can block is this monamine oxidase. And there's two medications that do that, selectively and the med medication I mentioned at the beginning of the And again, the idea is this is supposed to make your levodopa pill last uh, maybe 
25 to 30 percent longer than it would without using these enzyme blockers. Uh, selegiline is actually broken down into amphetamine-like products. It's a bit of a stimulator, so you're not supposed to take it after noon because it will prevent you from sleeping. And you have to be careful in the elderly patients because it can aggravate hallucinations. Vaseline isn't broken down into amphetamine, so it's probably generally better tolerated, even in the, in the elderly, it's a reasonable option. But it's an expensive pill, and it's not covered by pharmacare and anatolin. As yet, so it hasn't been used a lot by me yet. So, for these fluctuations, you can use long acting preparations, you can have these enzyme inhibitors. If you go back to that red jelly bean pill, you have to need because it can fill in gaps in between. And when people get particularly bad, you can actually grind up your daily dose of levodopa, put it in a jug of tang. Uh, and drink it every hour throughout the day and, and smooth up your regime. Now, don't do that without your doctor advising exactly how to do that. The people whose pills only last a couple hours anyway and they're having trouble all day long with symptoms, it's one way of eating things out. And if they're young and they have no memory problems, brain surgery becomes a problem. Uh, I'm going to go past that. And the brain surgery involves putting electrodes into the brain. Now, to understand how that could possibly work, you have to try to explain this. My analogy is this triangular area, which is the basal ganglia, which is where the oil dopamine acts. And the motor here, the thalamus, drives movement. If you don't have enough dopamine, this doesn't work properly, and the motor slows down. So people are actually better off if you try to disconnect the braking system. And so the electrodes, could, they just put them right here to disconnect this from there. There's another nucleus called the subthalamic nucleus, which is where they found better success with these. So typically, the surgeons will implant an electrode in the subthalamic nucleus and help parts. Patients will have a frame on, they'll go into a uh, scanner so they can locate the aspect of the brain in three dimensions. This is about the size of the electrodes and uh, go quite deep. Each lead actually has four little contacts that you can electrically alter the program to do different things. That's a higher, higher power picture. And so let's show you a guy. This is him with the stimulator on, he's showing you this coordination, quite normal looking. And he's gonna shut it off, so you can see, actually, a very short period of time, you can see how he originally presented. The first symptoms he started out was tremor in his left arm. Over time, it proceeded to affect the left leg as well. He started getting facial masking, stopped blinking, face got tighter. Gradually, his Parkinson spread to the other leg and then to the opposite arm. As he got stiffer, he gets restless in the chair. His facial is warm, the facial expression is more masked. Tremor becomes increasing in increasing in amplitude over time. And this is what he was, would look like uh, when his pills wore off as well. And his dexterity is pretty much gone at this point. He's kind of open and close his finger and his thumb. His face looks really uncomfortable. Barely accomplished this task of rotating his hands. And it works remarkably quickly. Push this button as he gets it over the little pacemaker in it that's in the chest wall. Great sigh of relief. And so the right for the right candidate, the right candidate is a young person who's otherwise medically well. Those pills work really well when they work for the symptoms. And uh, 
those are the ones that are fluctuating and just aren't stable, so they even them up really well. So, I'll stop. Thank you for your attention.